Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, June 6th, 2023. And today we actually commemorate our 17-year anniversary, June 26th. 2006. I figured the best way to say thank you, thank you for being a part of this, whether this is your first day here with us or you've been here for every single one since day one. Well, first of all, was to say thank you. I can't say that enough. I'm extremely grateful for everyone who has contributed time, energy, finances and the like to our work. But I also wanted to share with you stuff that we've learned over the years. Of course, we focus on things in a short term, trying to accomplish step by step for liberty, goals to advance and support the Constitution and liberty. But I also have learned that we have to kind of zoom out. And I want to share with you what we've learned over the years. Uh, I think at least, I mean, this could change from year in, year out. And I try to do something along these lines every anniversary season. But what I believe to be the five top core principles needed to successfully set a foundation for a free society at some point in the future. I want to get right to it. And the number one that we got to start with is that rights are not gifts from government. It's not really liberty if it requires a government permission slip. And we've got tons of quotes from the founding generation on this, but I want to highlight a few of them here from Thomas Paine in The Rights of Man, Part 2. He said, it is a perversion of terms to say that a charter gives rights. I know those of you who have watched or listened to the show for a while, you've heard me say over and over and over. It makes my skin crawl when I hear things like, oh, you're violating my Second Amendment rights or my First Amendment rights. It's almost as if people believe that you didn't have a natural right of self-defense, a right to keep and bear arms, a right to free speech and the press and things like that until the Bill of Rights was passed. But no one at the time of the founding ever ever even suggested that without passing those amendments and others, that the people wouldn't have these rights. These are just directions the government really trying to hammer home. Do not violate this stuff. It is a perversion of terms to say that a charter gives rights. Our rights are our rights by the nature of us being human, by the fact that we're born. It does not require us to be born in a particular place. Of course, You can actually exercise more or less of them depending on your situation, but certainly the theory behind it, the principle behind it, is that our rights exist because we're human. Here from the Declaration of Independence, for example, this is Independence Day season as well, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident. And of course, Jefferson, some years later, he pointed out, I forget who the letter was that he wrote this to, but I'm sure he said it a number of times. But he basically said when you know drafting the Declaration, they weren't trying to come up with new views, new principles, but he was trying to come up with an expression of the American mind. Put pen to paper, words to paper that express to the world what a 13 clock striking is one, as John Adams described it at the time, this unusual situation, how the people of the colonies viewed their relationship to liberty the government, and the like. We hold these truths to be self-evident. It is so obvious. Does it even need to be pointed out? But look at how things are in the world. Of course we do. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable or unalienable, unalienable rights, that among these are life among these. This is not an exhaustive list. And I know some people say, well, why did they remove property? This is just, these are three that they're listing. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here's Samuel Adams in The Rights of Colonists, November of 1772, who said, among the natural rights of the colonists, again, among these rights, this is not an exhaustive list of our natural rights, among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, a right to life. Second, to liberty. And thirdly, to property together with the right to support and defend them in the best manner they can, because they recognized, of course, that the right of self-defense was a primary or first law of nature, and this is how Adams followed that up. He said, these are evident branches of, evident, rather than deductions from the duty of self-preservation, commonly called the first law of nature. And you see some very similar statements between what Adams had in 1772, the father of the American Revolution, and Thomas Jefferson, and, well, the committee, 
and, of course, the Second Continental Congress, the final version, the Declaration of Independence. These truths are self-evident. These are evident branches of the duty of self-preservation. It's not just a good idea. It's a duty of self-preservation to people like Samuel Adams and the old revolutionaries. Now, I covered this in some detail in an episode of July 8th, 2022, our Natural Rights Foundation. I'm going to include a link to that, plus a link to all the original source documents and articles and stuff that I'm citing in this episode, primarily source documents. I'll be linking to that in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty in a couple hours after this live stream is done this morning or, well, whatever time it is by you. So number one, rights are not gifts from government. We have to get people to understand or to be on board with the idea that their rights are their rights, whether the government happens to want to violate them or not. Number two is, well, government power. It's always dangerous to liberty. Unfortunately, a lot of people, and this is something that we learned over the years, we've seen it happen over and over and over again. As we try to work to nullify one thing or another uh, on a state and local level, nullify the feds, nullify some program, we find that the people who support and oppose these things change based on who's in charge in Washington, D.C. But if you want to nullify all federal gun control, it shouldn't matter which team is in power in the Capitol, in Washington. Because if your rights are your rights and government is violating your rights, it doesn't matter who's doing it. it doesn't, it's not like it magically goes away. We see the opposite happen. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And that, I think, is because so many people believe that government power is only dangerous when it's in the hands of people that they oppose. They don't recognize that every power you give government today is a power that will be in the hands of someone who absolutely hates you in the future. And I think... That, that's a little hyperbole, but it's pretty true. Here's how Oliver Ellsworth, I think he was number three as Chief Justice of the United States, a leading founder, uh, influence, a lot of influence uh, during the ratification debates in Connecticut as well. He said, a power of doing good always implies a power to do evil if the person or party be disposed. Uh, always. So even if you like what government is doing today, and I don't think anybody watching us, watching or listening to this show is really a big fan of what's going on with government. You shouldn't be. And if you are, well, welcome. Hopefully you won't be for long or hopefully you'll stick around for a while. And over time, you'll be on board with the idea that government power is bad. But let's say uh, we were a couple of years ago. I had a lot of people complain about us going after government because they like the person who is in charge. And that is really a bad mentality. You don't. It's not about personalities. It's about zooming out and understanding the big picture. A power of doing good always implies a power to do evil. Here's William Lenore in the North Carolina ratifying convention. He said it is natural for talking about <laughs> natural rights. And we also have to understand the tendency and nature of humankind. We're very flawed creatures. Yours truly is so much included in that. It is natural for men to aspire to power. It is the nature of mankind to be tyrannical. So if we understand, like so many in the founding generation, the old revolutionaries, that human nature leads towards a lot of problems, then, of course, you don't want to give them the ability to have, well, that kind of power. Here's how Thomas Jefferson described it. This is one of my favorite quotes. Law is often but the tyrant's will, and always so when it violates the rights of the individual. And he was talking about in context. He said, I do not say, you know, liberty within the bounds of the law because law is often just the tyrant's will. You have to understand that people with power will make it law. And the idea that you're a quote, law-abiding citizen, and we see that a lot in the right to keep and bear arms community. We don't want to violate the rights of law-abiding citizens. But if you think about how many laws there are on the books, rules, regulations, or it's just on the federal level, I mean, it's tens of thousands of these things. Almost everybody, I think there's a great book I've, that I've been told about that I have yet to read called Three Felonies a Day. It's basically the notion that almost everybody commits three federal crimes every single day on average. And it's because law is often just but the tyrant's will, again, and always so when it violates the rights of the individual. So law can also be the tyrant's will to Thomas Jefferson, even if they're not violating rights, because to the founding generation, arbitrary power, which is listed as one of the declaration of uh, grievances in the Declaration of Independence, arbitrary power is the definition of tyranny. So when government can just do something on a whim, 
because it decides that it thinks it is best for the people, even if you think, again, even if you think it's good and they're not violating your rights by doing that, just by exercising uh, this arbitrary power that they're not authorized to exercise, then, well, it's bad. That is also just the tyrant's will. Here's how Benjamin Franklin put it, another one of my favorites. All As all history informs us, this is from the Philadelphia Convention in June of 1787. As all history informs us, there has been in every state and kingdom a constant kind of warfare between the governing and the governed. So number two is government power is always dangerous to liberty. Rights are not gift from government. This is, I think, a pretty good way to kick it off. I've got a couple more to go, but I want to take a quick moment since it's anniversary day to just say a huge thank you to just a handful of people who have joined us as members recently. Nothing helps us roll up our sleeves every single day and do this kind of work, get this kind of message out to more and more people, more than the financial faith and support of our members. Uh, there's a Stephen in Texas. Thank you so much. Rebecca in Tennessee. Richard in Ohio, Mark in North Carolina, another Mark in Florida, good name, Kristen in Montana, and a bunch of other people. I'm so grateful for your support. New, old, long time, lapsed, returned, doesn't matter. And even if you don't have the financial capability to support us, just being here with us, sharing, smashing the like button, leaving reviews on the podcast platforms, all that stuff triggers algorithms and helps spread the word. So I'm very grateful. If you do want to join them, if you want to consider joining us as a member, uh, our membership program starts out as little as 2 bucks a month. We also have annual, five-year, and lifetime options, all at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. So let's get back to it. Number one, rights are not gifts from government. Number two, government power is always dangerous. Doesn't matter who has it. Even the best of the best. If they have it, you don't want them to have it. You, if someone who is really good got in power and they just wanted to wield the power for good things, stuff that you like, that's still bad because the next person is going to have that power to do the opposite. The only person who's good who gets in power, and it's very, this just doesn't happen, really. The only person who's good that gets in power is the one who relentlessly works, relentlessly works to impede the enforcement of every government act that shouldn't exist. That's, that's the standard, at least mine. Number three is power comes from the people, not to the people. You know the old phrase, power to the people? That's getting it backwards. This is a population on its knees begging for stuff to be returned to them from government. Power ultimately starts from the people. Now, they've clearly given away too much or allowed too much to be given away because we live under the largest government in history. But that doesn't mean that it still is not in the people's hands. Here's how George Mason put it. All power was originally lodged in and consequently is derived from the people. James Wilson on the other end of the spectrum. So George Mason, very well-known anti-federalist. James Wilson, one of the biggest big government guy on the federalist side, but a leading legal mind made it on the Supreme Court. He put it this way, the supreme power resides in the people. I would say the, the proper way to describe that under the Constitution is the supreme power, that is sovereignty or final authority, resides in the people of the several states. Now, I don't know if Wilson would agree with me, but here's how John Jay describes it. Here's first chief justice, author of a handful of the Federalist Papers as well, describing how the Constitution affirms this principle that power comes from the people and the Constitution, as Thomas Paine described, is an act of the people, not of government. The Constitution only serves to point out that part of the people's business which they think proper by it to refer to the management of the persons therein designated. We don't really talk like that these days. I mean, everything has to be simplified and dumbed down, not for you guys, which is cool. I like being able to share that. A lot of times if we put this kind of message out to the general public, people will say, what does this mean? But really, it should be very clear, and I think it's very clear for those of you who are here watching or listening, that it is. this is... A, and a description of the flow of power. The people have described through the Constitution what their agents will do for them, what they have authorized. And of course, whatever power the people have given because they have final and supreme power, the people can ultimately, if they decide to, take back. So power comes from the people. It's not power to the people. That's number three. Number four, I think, is really essential. Constitutions don't enforce themselves. Words on paper don't enforce themselves. They don't stop government. They never did. They never will. 
Here's how John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, put it. He could also be called the father of the Articles of Confederation. He was a supporter of ratification. Here in his Fabius letters in 1788, I believe it was number four, he describes it like this. A good constitution promotes, but not always produces a good administration. Now, someone who doesn't look at the big picture, okay, that's an interesting statement, but what does that mean? Dickinson is basically telling us, look, it doesn't matter how good your constitution is. You cannot guarantee by words on paper alone, you cannot guarantee that the people who get in power are going to follow the rules. That should be as obvious as can be today. And it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. It should be extremely obvious today. A good constitution promotes, but not always produces a good administration. And even a bad constitution could... Well, promote a bad administration, but you don't know how it's going to be. Ultimately, it kind of gets down to other stuff. James Madison, and I'll get to that, quote, other stuff here in just a moment. James Madison discussed this in some detail in Federalist number 48. He referred to, and we see this uh, often uh, in, in throughout kind of the founding generation, the idea that a document isn't going to start or stop the government from doing anything. It helps the people draw a line in the sand, understand what, what it's authorized to the government. But Madison was very clear in Federalist 48. And in fact, he called the Constitution that he was calling for ratification a parchment barrier. He had said earlier in that Federalist paper he specifically said, you know, uh, and this is me paraphrasing. I should probably have the full quote in front of me, but I'll get to a different one from later in that paper. But basically he was saying, like, look, the the security that most people have relied on in the state, various state constitutions is basically words on paper, a parchment barrier. But this is proven pretty obviously to not get the job done. There has to be something else. And he summed up Federalist 48 with this. A mere demarcation on parchment of the constitutional limits of the several departments is not a sufficient guard against those encroachments which lead to a tyrannical concentration of all the powers of government in the same hands. Short version, centralization of power is deadly to liberty. The founding generation certainly recognized that they lived under the largest government, largest empire in the history of the world at that time. And they knew that, well, here's Madison very clearly saying, like, look, just rely on these mere parchment barriers is how we put it earlier. Putting it down on paper isn't what's going to get the job done. There is something else. And that something else is my number five for the day. It's up to the people. The people have to learn how to love liberty. They have to understand their constitution. And they have to learn how to protect and defend their own constitution and their own liberty, whether the government happens to like it or agree with it or not. If you rely on government to limit itself, you shouldn't be surprised when government always grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. If you rely on getting the right people in power, you shouldn't be surprised when people get in power, love the power that they're wielding, and they try to use it for ways that, well, supposedly you like. And then the next people come in. And so this kind of ties it all together. Ultimately, it is up to the people to get the job done. Here's James Iredell, another Supreme Court, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court in the first court uh, from George Washington. Man, I am not figuring out how to pull this up. I did not know I had that feature. Anyways, James Iredell put it this way. In the North Carolina Ratifying Convention, the only resource against usurpation is the inherent right of the people to prevent its exercise. This is tying basically all these top five together, I think, very nicely. The only resource, Iredell is pointing out that, well, we can, he was in context, he's basically saying like, look, we're doing the best we can with what we're trying to draft here. But ultimately, you know, someone's going to do things wrong. How do we deal with that? And I'm going to get to that question here in just a moment from Dickinson as well. But he said the only resource, not something you try at the end of the day, we're going to convince government, one branch of the government, to tell another branch of the government that the government shouldn't have been doing what the government's been doing all along, and that's how we're going to have freedom. No. The only resource against usurpation. And usurpation is a theft of power from the sovereign people of the several states. It is stealing power. It is an exercise of power not delegated. It's the inherent right. Again, natural right. The people don't need to ask for permission to limit the government that supposedly works for them. Now, I know a lot of people say, hey, you work for me here. You got to stop doing this. I'll call you and beg you. 
But that's not what they're getting at. Iredell said the people will resist if government usurps power is not delegated to it. Again, the only resource of the uh, against usurpation is the inherent right of the people to prevent its exercise. And here's um, James Madison, Federalist 49. So Federalist 48, he's pointing out, well, uh, words on paper don't enforce themselves. A mere parchment barrier isn't going to get the job done. That's not going to happen. And then here he is in Federalist number 40, 49, the very next paper, a few days later, quoting Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson, I believe, from notes on the state of Virginia. Yes, quoting Jefferson here. A lot of people want you to think that Jefferson had no influence on ratification, but that is just nonsense. Anyways, that's a different episode. As the people are the only legitimate fountain of power, and it is from them that the constitutional charter under which the several branches of government hold their power is derived— it seems strictly consonant to the Republican theory to recur to the same original authority, not only whenever it may be necessary to enlarge, diminish, or new model the powers of government, but also whenever any one of the departments may commit encroachments on the chartered authorities of the others. <laughs> so much done back there. People are the source of power. They... Uh, government is, you know, at the bottom of the food chain, or at least it's supposed to be. All powers derive from the people. They get to choose what they want to do. And, of course, there's alter or abolish. He's citing this as well. Madison is citing this as well, quoting Jefferson. If they want to enlarge, diminish, or new model the powers of government. This goes back to alter or abolish from the Declaration of Independence. But also, it's not just to change or to eliminate that government. It's also anytime the government goes beyond the limits, each department of the government goes beyond the limits that are delegated to it, then you resort to the original authority of the people to keep them in check. It's it's a far more kind of word salad way, maybe a more eloquent way than I'm used to actually expressing things. But ultimately, it's the people that have to keep it in check. And that's how John Dickinson put it in that same Fabius number 4 in 1788, where he was saying a good constitution promotes but doesn't always produce a good administration. So he went on to ask, he said, well, what is to be done? When there is a bad administration, what is then to be done? He said, well, the question is immediately put before the supreme sovereignty of the people. The people have supreme sovereignty, sovereignty meaning final authority. And this is how Dickinson put it. It is their duty to watch and their right to take care that the Constitution be preserved, or in the Roman phrase on perilous occasions to provide that the Republic receive no damage. Now, obviously, we are nowhere close to these five principles today. The people have failed to do their job in support of liberty, in support of defending the Constitution for generations at this point. And it's hard to imagine turning things around in the short term if you see the big picture. If you're anything like me, you you can't, like, promising a silver bullet, just get this dude in office or this court case or this thing passed, we just need this one thing, is absurd. Because so many people are literally begging, millions and millions of people are li literally begging for more power over one issue or over another. Rather than looking at government as the source of the problem, they're looking at government as the solution. So that's a very difficult situation, but this is the foundation. If we want to build a foundation, if you want to build something for liberty and you don't have a strong foundation, the odds of success are very low. So I think these are incredibly essential, if not indispensable, for the population at large. Now, again, we're nowhere close to it, but that doesn't mean... It can't be turned around. And that's what so much of our work is about here. Again, uh, we used to focus more on some short-term things. Let's uh, get a win on this and get a win on that. But I think it's so important for us. You know, 17 years is a long time. I never, I never imagined the impact that we'd have. And we're far way beyond anything I ever dreamed of. My goal was, okay, I'm going to start blogging about the fact that, uh, you know, really, it was just this wasn't started as an organization with funds or anything. It was a dude who worked an $11 an hour customer service job who was like, I need to do something. I want to do some blogs and point out that it doesn't matter which team is in power. Power keeps growing. We need to line the sand. So I started talking about that, and then I started pointing out various ways, and other people supported and started doing some of the same with us, and we kept growing from there. As John Dickinson told us, 
Small things grow great by concord, or Thomas Jefferson told us the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. But I also recognize that you can't just focus on the short term, because if you only focus on the short term and you're missing these essential principles, a lot of the short term efforts you make fail because you don't get the big picture right, the big foundation. Again, now that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. But here's how St. George Tucker put it, and this helps me. Uh, think really long-term, even if it's well beyond my existence here on earth. Anyways, he said, the acquiescence of the people of a state under any usurped authority for any length of time can never deprive them of the right of resuming the sovereign power into their own hands whenever they think fit or are able to do so, since that right is perfectly unalienable. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you understand how grateful I am for you spending some of your time with me today. Again, whether this is your first episode, you've been here for all of our episodes, you've been a part of the TAC for a long time or a short time, you're not even yet. I'm just very grateful. Thank you so much. I will probably take time and look through the chat a little bit later today. I see uh, Joseph, Kirk, Ward Lawrence. Good to see a buddy. Been around for a long time. Uh, Lonnie. Senator DT as well, white bearded GNU, uh, lots of awesome people. Tim, Dixie Strong, thank you all for watching, listening, live, archive. I'll look look through those comments. Continue leaving them, whether it's live or in the archive. While I'm doing the post-production and getting the links set up for the blog post at 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty, I often check through the comments over at uh, uh, YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey primarily. So if you've got some questions or comments or feedback, that's uh, over the next couple hours is where I'll probably uh, you'll be able to reach me again. I really appreciate you being here. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope your Monday is off to a good start. And I hope to see you next time here on the path to liberty. Oh, we're not done yet. I want to point out next week. It's the first time since I've been doing this show in almost four years now. Maybe it's more than four years. I haven't really kept track of the anniversary of this show either. Uh, but I'm taking a full week off for Independence uh, Day. I'm going to catch up on some stuff here at home. I'm going to catch up on some work that I'm way behind on. I'm getting way behind on emails and just some logistics things. So I am going to be off all next week. But the show, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this week, and then I'll be back to the normal schedule after that. Again, thanks for being here. Hope you have a great day. Hope to see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.